Hi, hello, welcome. This Pentecost Sunday message is coming to you from Free School Court Church Bridge End uh, in South Wales in the United Kingdom. Many years ago in one of the world's major cities uh, an electrified tram system was going to be introduced to the city. On the day on which the trams were to begin to operate everything was in place but nothing moved. Apparently there was some problem with respect to connecting the power supply to run to the trams. Some Christians have seen in that incident something of a picture or a parable to illustrate aspects of the Christian life and the life of the Christian church. What they mean is something like this. Uh, everything can be correct, can be in order and in place but without the power of the Holy Spirit connecting to the life of the individual Christian and to the life of the church, then nothing will really happen. There'll be no movement, there'll be no progress, there'll be no advance. And that surely is a sentiment with which all Christians uh, agree. After all, did not Jesus say on one occasion to his disciples, Without me, you can do nothing. And since Jesus works in his people and in his church, through and by means of the Holy Spirit, it inevitably follows that without the Holy Spirit, Christians really can do nothing. That is nothing of real spiritual value and fruitfulness. So surely all Christians are agreed upon our need of the Holy Spirit and of his power in our lives. But not all Christians are agreed as to how that works out in practical terms. In particular there is not agreement, in fact disagreement, I don't mean by that uh, unpleasant disagreement, but rather a difference of understanding as to what the Bible teaches with respect to the meaning and significance of what happened on the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago for Christians and for the Christian Church today. And this being Pentecost Sunday, this is something which I want to probe a little in this message. This message is going out on Pentecost Sunday evening this morning I looked very generally and just sought to draw some very uh, basic though very important and simple lessons uh, from what happened on the day of Pentecost. I want to go into this a little bit more deeply now, not only in this message, but it's going to occupy the next two messages, uh, God willing, which will be sent out uh, a week after Pentecost Sunday. And what I want to do is this, in this message I want to uh, look at a particular teaching, a particular belief which is held by many sincere Christians as to what Pentecost means today. And then having uh, set out that teaching, I want to evaluate it in the light of what the Bible actually says. And then I want to draw some important practical lessons for us. In the next message I want to do uh, the same sort of thing but with a different teaching that is also held by equally sincere Christians and in fact it's a teaching which is almost the exact opposite of that which uh, we shall consider in this message. Again I then want to evaluate that teaching and draw some lessons from it and then in the final message I want to set out positively what I believe uh, the day of Pentecost is really all about. I'm stressing the need to evaluate things. We read of a group of uh, people in the Bible, they were in a city called Berea, and we read that they were of a noble spirit, they examined against the scriptures the things that were being taught, and that's something which all Christians have to do, especially on matters with which Christians have a different understanding. We need to listen patiently to one another. We mustn't go disfellowshipping one another. We mustn't go treating uh, fellow brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, uh, believers in Jesus Christ who are our brothers and sisters. We mustn't go treating them as enemies. 
what we must do is listen patiently and carefully to what they say but then when it doesn't matter how sincere they are it doesn't matter how godly they are we must evaluate what they say in the light of God's word so what I want to do now in this message is to set forth uh, this teaching that's held by many Christians in the world and it's basically this that what happened on the day of Pentecost is a pattern and an example which needs to be uh, duplicated in the lives of all Christians today. So let me uh, now unpack that and explain what I mean by that and what that teaching uh, in particular is. On the day of Pentecost you have these disciples of Jesus Christ. They were true disciples, they were real disciples, they were saved people. They had been born again of the Spirit of God and the Holy Spirit therefore lived within them having given them this new life and this new birth. But Jesus Christ told them that although they were to go into all the world and to spread the message about himself, before they were to do that they were to wait in Jerusalem. What were they to wait for? Well he said that they were to wait for that which his Father, God the Father, had promised them. That is something spoken about uh, in the Old Testament. Something, in fact, which had also been spoken about by John the Baptist, and Jesus reminds them of this. He said, John, indeed, uh, John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And it's also recorded at the end of Luke's Gospel that Jesus told them that they were to wait in Jerusalem, they were to wait in the city, until they were clothed with power from on high. So what God the Father had promised, this being baptized with the Holy Spirit, meant that they would be clothed with power from on high and they were not to set out on this mission of making disciples of all the nations until they had been baptized with the Holy Spirit and until they had been clothed with power from on high. And so the teaching goes, if that was necessary for those disciples who after all had spent three years with Jesus, they'd had the most uh, remarkable uh, experience and training of anyone who's ever lived. But if they needed to wait in Jerusalem to receive this uh, baptism with the Holy Spirit, then surely that is something which is needed by every Christian today. You can be born again, you can be saved, a disciple of Jesus Christ, a believer in him, and yet not have been baptized with the Holy Spirit, and that is a great, great need. I remember hearing a preacher put it like this many years ago. He said something like this. Many Christians are on the right side of Easter, and good, of, East, of Good Friday and Easter, but they're on the wrong side of Pentecost. What he meant was this, uh, that there are many people, they are true Christians, they've understood the message of Good Friday, that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. They've understood the message of Easter Sunday, that having died according to the Scriptures, he was buried, and then on the third day, he was raised according to the Scriptures. And believing that message, they've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, they've been forgiven their sins, they're accepted by God. If they die, they go immediately into the presence of Jesus Christ, and when he comes again, their bodies will be resurrected, reunited with their souls, they are saved. No doubt about that. But what this preacher was really getting at was, uh, they're on the wrong side of Pentecost. That is to say, they haven't experienced this uh, baptism with the Holy Spirit and consequently there's a lack of power in their lives. Now this particular teaching uh, can be put out in a number of different forms and let me just give you a few examples of the different ways in which this teaching may find expression. Some people link it with power to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Power to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And just as the disciples were to wait in Jerusalem until they were clothed with power from on high, so the teaching goes, uh, though you're a Christian, you need to wait upon the Lord 
until he gives you this baptism, until he baptizes you with the Holy Spirit, and thus you are clothed with power to serve him. I remember a friend of mine many, many years ago. Uh, he told me how it was in his church. He said, you know, in our church, until you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit, you cannot serve in any function whatsoever in the church. You can't teach in Sunday school. You can't teach a Friday children's club. You can't teach the young people. You can't be a deacon. You can't be an elder. You can do nothing. If you're a woman, you can't lead a ladies' meeting or a children's meeting. You must wait until you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit. Of course, he said, they're interested in what you believe. You've got to have right belief. They are concerned about your behavior, that there's a certain godliness of character. They are concerned that you've got the gift. It's no good somebody uh, teaching children if they haven't got the gift. But, he said, although you've got all that, if you haven't been baptized with the Holy Spirit, you won't be involved in any service of the Lord in his church. And then there are others who put it somewhat differently. They say, well, this is all about power for living the Christian life, not just service now, but, but wherever you are, this is about power for service. And they sometimes put it in the following way. Until you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit, you're a little bit like a car that isn't firing on all its cylinders. It's spluttering along. And you can hear it almost backfiring. It, it just isn't going as it should. Then a person is baptized with the Holy Spirit and now they are firing on all cylinders and the car isn't spluttering and the car is moving along very, very nicely. And then some would add something to this. They would say, that the initial evidence of having been baptized with the Holy Spirit is that you speak with other tongues. Because on the day of Pentecost we read that the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke in other tongues or in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now there is the teaching and in one or other of those forms it has been and is believed by many, many Christians in different parts of the world. And I hasten to add that many of them are very godly Christians, they're very earnest Christians, zealous and sincere. Now, what do we make of that teaching? Is it right? And don't react instinctively. You see, some Christians, when they hear uh, talk of the fact perhaps they've been Christians for years and they've been active in their church and then they hear uh, teaching like this that says well you haven't been baptized with the Holy Spirit you shouldn't be doing that and they think to themselves well, well no I haven't had this two-stage experience that the disciples had and they get defensive and, and, and they get reactionary and, and instead of examining the scriptures they dig their heels in we mustn't do that some people, they hear the word, uh, the phrase speaking in tongues and they, they get alarmed for a whole raft of reasons. Uh, but, but no, we, we must examine this teaching in the light of the word of God. We mustn't be prejudiced. And certainly, uh, the, those who hold to this teaching, they appeal to the word of God. It's certainly true that the disciples did have to wait in Jerusalem. Jesus did, did tell them that they would be clothed with power from on high and they wouldn't be clothed with that power from on high until they'd been baptized with the Holy Spirit and the book of Acts chapter 2 definitely says that they spoke in other languages quite clearly they spoke in languages um, which the people who were listening to them understood let me just say this in passing however that what happened in Acts chapter 2 is quite different from the gift of speaking in tongues which we read in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through to 14. Because on the day of Pentecost, the people who listened uh, to the disciples proclaiming the mighty deeds of God in these other languages, they understood the languages. Whereas in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul says that whoever is speaking in a tongue is not speaking to men but to God. Indeed, no one understands what he says. That's why Paul says that such... Uh, uh, speaking in tongues must not take place in the church unless there's someone present to interpret. 
and, and if someone is going to give out that message and there isn't an interpreter, then he must pray for the gift of interpretation himself. In other words, what happens in Acts chapter 2 is quite different from what we read of in 1 Corinthians. There's another difference, of course, in 1 Corinthians. Paul makes it abundantly clear that this is a spiritual gift which isn't given to everyone. Whereas in what, in what happened on the day of Pentecost, they were all filled with the Spirit and they all spoke in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, I'm not going to go into the question in this message as to whether that gift of tongues that's mentioned in 1 Corinthians is something that exists for today or if it's something that ceased uh, at some point during the early church. That's another area where Christians take a different view. And uh, we needn't go into that in this message because I'm just dealing with that gift of tongues in passing. But it's just to say that there's a difference between the two and, and we mustn't react. We must examine what the scriptures say. But now, although it's very true that the scriptures say that the disciples were to wait in Jerusalem until they were clothed with power from on high, it seems to me very, very clear that this passage is not laid down as a pattern which is to be replicated or duplicated in all Christians in the history of the church and, and, and in the church at large. As I want to say in, in a later message, I think what's going on in Acts chapter 2 is very much tied to something very, very specific to that particular uh, occasion. Now, uh, let, let me then evaluate this teaching then in the light of the scriptures. And the first thing to say is this, that of course it isn't true to say that the disciples had been unable to serve the Lord until they received this baptism with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. For example, we, we read in Matthew's Gospel and chapter 10 that Jesus sent his disciples out and he gave them authority. He gave them authority to heal the sick. He gave them authority to drive out demons. He uh, told them that they were to teach and to preach and so they were serving the Lord. Again, it isn't true that there's a simple before and after that uh, prior to the day of Pentecost they were really bumping along and then after the day of Pentecost everything dramatically changed. That isn't true. Not only had they cast out demons, not only had they healed the sick, not only had they been teaching when they were with Jesus and when he sent them out, but we read in Acts chapter 1 that Peter, this is of course prior to the day of Pentecost, Peter has an, an extraordinary rich understanding of the scriptures of the Old Testament Bible and he's able to pull one passage from and another passage together and show how they related to the situation with which they were then faced uh, with regard to the fact that Judas Iscariot uh, had died and there needed to be another apostle. Now Peter didn't have that understanding of the scripture prior to what we read in Acts chapter 1 but he's got it now and this is before the day of Pentecost. And the explanation and the reason for that is that we are told in the opening three verses of Acts chapter 1 that Jesus met with his disciples after his resurrection over a 40 day period and he gave them instructions and note this carefully through the Holy Spirit. What that means, of course, is that instead of there being, as it were, two watertight compartments, what these men were before Pentecost and what they were after Pentecost, you've rather got something of, of a series of phases going on, almost like a spectrum. And what happens on the day of Pentecost is, it were, is as it were, the climax, but it's not a simple before and after. There was a phase, uh, different phases to what was happening to them. Now that, as I want to explain in a later message, is tightly tied to the unique historical situation in which those disciples found themselves and it's a situation in which no Christian finds himself or herself today. But let me move on to this idea that uh, one needs this baptism with the Holy Spirit to have power really to live the Christian life. And that without having this second experience, or second blessing as it's sometimes called, uh, you really 
not firing on all cinders. You're spluttering and you need this really to live as a Christian. Well, the simple answer to that, of course, is that none of the New Testament letters teaches this. Take, for example, the letters to the Corinthians. Just take Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Now, here are Christians who are in a, a very bad way. They are dividing amongst one another and uh, there's rivalry on the basis of personalities. One is following one personality, one is following another. Uh, there's squabbling amongst them. There's arrogance and pride amongst them. The church is wrongly tolerant of gross immorality. A man is committing incest. He's sleeping with his father's wife. Seems it was his stepmother. And the church is quite happy with this. There are uh, Christians in the church who are regularly consorting with prostitutes. There are Christians taking other Christians to court instead of resolving their differences. There are people getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. There's an abuse of spiritual gifts. I could go on. There was lovelessness in the church. They, they were in a very, very poor way. But when Paul writes his first letter to them, he doesn't say to them, now no, look here, brothers and sisters, you're obviously not doing very well, and the trouble with you is this. You're spluttering along because you're not firing on all cylinders. What you need is to get baptised with the Holy Spirit and when that happens you'll be lifted into a new spiritual plane and you'll start to make real progress. He, he doesn't say any such thing. He reasons with them. He reminds them of who they are in Christ. He, he tells them that they are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He tells them that they are to glorify God in their bodies. In his second letter he tells them that they are to perfect holiness in, in the, the fear of the Lord, he does not tell them that they need to seek this second blessing. And what we read in the Corinthian correspondence, we find in all the New Testament letters, that the New Testament way of teaching holiness is to remind Christians of who they are in Christ. Since then you have been raised with Christ, Paul says to the Colossians, set your Mind on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your heart on, on those things there. And, and he then goes on and he tells them that they've got to put to death uh, sinful deeds. They've got to cast them off. They've got to put on uh, what belongs to the new person in Christ. You see, there's no crisis experience that is going to get them out of this mess. What they've got to do is apply the teaching of the word of God. Oh, but, says somebody, it's not as simple as that. Because the letters of the New Testament assume what has already happened in the book of Acts. And what has happened in the book of Acts is that people have had this two-stage experience. Well, now then, l let's look at this. First of all, the whole problem with reasoning like that is as follows. If these Corinthians had had this two-stage experience, and if this two-stage, this second experience is supposed to lift you into a new spiritual realm, then why on earth were they in the mess in which they found themselves? If this baptism with the Holy Spirit is what gives you real power to live the Christian life as it should be lived, then how on earth were they in the appalling mess in which they found themselves? It just doesn't add up. But more than that, it just isn't true either that the book of Acts teaches this two-stage experience. Just think of the sermon which Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. What does he say to his hearers? They cry out, what must we do? They, they've come under this great conviction of sin. And Peter says to them, repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, by which he means the gift who is the Holy Spirit. He doesn't tell them it's going to be two-stage. He says the promise is for them, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And by promise there, he doesn't mean that you repent and you receive forgiveness, and then there's this promise of getting a further blessing, he means the promise in fulfilment. And so, therefore, he doesn't teach a two-stage experience. 
And as you go through the book of Acts, you find Paul, as he goes to the city of Philippi, they don't have a two-stage experience there. He writes his letter to the Philippians. He doesn't say, oh, well, when I was with you, you, you didn't have this second experience. You need it now. He doesn't say that. Similarly, with his letter to the Thessalonians, there's no mention of a two-stage experience there. He doesn't mention that in either of his two letters to them, that, well, you didn't have it when I was with you. You need it now. Likewise, with Corinth, he goes to the Corinthians. And so you see... Um, elsewhere Paul puts it like this in his letter to Titus and in the third chapter he's speaking of what is true of all Christians he's, tr he's speaking of salvation and he says when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared he saved us not because of righteous things that we had done but of his own mercy by the washing of new birth and renewal of the Holy Spirit whom he poured out generously upon us that having been justified by his grace we might become heirs of eternal life now that word poured out is exactly the same verb that is used in Acts chapter 2 and here Paul is speaking of all Christians he's speaking of being justified by faith and he's saying that when, when we come to Christ and we experience salvation there are a number of blessings one of which is we are justified by grace through faith alone but also we receive this renewal of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is poured out upon us. Exactly the same language that is used in Acts chapter 2. Ah, oh, but wait a minute, says somebody. The book of Acts does refer to people having a two-stage experience. It refers to it in Acts chapter 8. After Philip has gone down to Samaria and many people are saved and they, they rejoice and yet... Peter and John, the apostles, go down and the people have not yet received the Holy Spirit and they have to lay their hands upon them so that they receive the Holy Spirit. And then we read of Paul as he goes to Ephesus. He meets there some disciples before ever um, pe people come under his... Uh, these aren't people who've heard his preaching. They're disciples. But he asks them, well, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And, and it's quite evident that they hadn't received the Holy Spirit. And so Peter, uh, Paul rather, lays his hands on them, prays for them, and they receive the Holy Spirit. And on that occasion, we're told they also spoke in tongues. Well, as I want to explain in the next message, both of those passages, in their different ways, are unique. What went on in Samaria, and I'll try to demonstrate it in the next message, was demonstrably unique. There were very specific features about what was going on there. And in fact, as I'm going to try to demonstrate in the next message, the passage proves too much. Likewise, in Acts chapter 19, with these disciples in Ephesus, they too were in a unique situation. It was a different situation from those in Samaria, but equally it was unique. Now, that being so, that being so, we haven't got in Acts chapter 2 a pattern for all Christians uh, to follow today. That, that isn't why that passage is there. Let me draw some uh, practical lessons uh, as I close to balance what I've just said. We must not, however, fall into the trap which the Laodicean Christians fell into and about whom we read in the book of Revelation in the third chapter. They become complacent. They weren't seeking God. They thought, that, excuse me, they thought they'd arrived. They were rich. They were increased with goods. They had everything. We must never get into that uh, condition of spiritual complacency. Secondly, Nothing that I have said denies that people may have some remarkable experiences during their Christian life. It is undoubtedly true that sometimes Christians, for a variety of reasons, get into a bad way and they are just spluttering along. And then they may have a meeting with the Lord and they come into a much closer walk with him. I'm not denying that for one moment whatsoever. All I am saying is that is not what Acts chapter 2 is all about. 
And of course, in, in the case of Christians who've just been spluttering along, what's usually happened is that at some point along the way, they've quenched the Holy Spirit, or they've vexed the Holy Spirit, and they've grieved the Holy Spirit, and they've been living a very substandard Christian life. And then perhaps suddenly they wake up to where they've been and they repent. And when they repent, of course, uh, they have a much closer walk then with the Lord and more intimate dealings with the Holy Spirit. All I'm saying is that that is not what Acts chapter 2 is about. Nor am I denying that there are some repeatable elements in what happened on the day of Pentecost. And this is very, very important. It will be very important when we come to examine the next almost opposite teaching, which wants to lock up everything that happened on the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago. But you know, one of the things that happened on the day of Pentecost is that the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit. But in Acts chapter 4, we read again, Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, he was filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, but he's filled with the Holy Spirit again in Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 4 rather. And then at the end of Acts chapter 4, we read of the whole company. This includes those who were converted on the day of Pentecost, and the 120 who were baptized with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, we read that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. There's Peter in the space of just three chapters. He's filled with the Holy Spirit three times on three occasions. And that certainly is repeatable. And that's something that is for today. Christians need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and there's an ongoing, an ongoing uh, surrender, as it were, of ourselves and submission of ourselves to the Holy Spirit in our daily lives. What Paul calls in Ephesians 5, he says, let yourselves uh, be continually being filled by the Holy Spirit. But that's a continuous thing. That's a commandment we are to obey. Here in Acts, this is more an empowering experience so that we read at the end of Acts chapter 4, and they spoke the word of God boldly. Peter was filled with the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. What was the result? He preached the Word of God boldly. What happens in Acts chapter 4 when he's filled with the Holy Spirit? He preaches the Word of God with boldness. What happens to the, the whole church when they are filled with the Spirit? They speak the Word of God boldly. That's a great and a crying need. Uh, do you stutter along and, and find yourself tongue-tied when, when called upon to speak the Word of the Gospel? Beloved, what's needed is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I stress that word filled. And I'm not being nitpicking here, but I've lost count of the number of times I've heard Christians pray that preachers will be anointed with the Holy Spirit. But you know, the New Testament uses that language of anointing with respect to Christians of something that has already happened, of something that isn't repeated or repeatable, and of something that's got nothing at all to do with preaching with power, but rather giving someone a stable assurance of the truth of the gospel. The Apostle John puts that very clearly in his first letter. It's in the second chapter. And you get it very clearly in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians in the first chapter, where it's, it's all about having a sure knowledge of the truth. So we, we shouldn't try to be, if I can put it like this, cleverer than God. If God in his word has said, filled with the Spirit, and that means one thing, and anointed with the Spirit means something different, then we should, we should pay heed to the words of Scripture and the word of God. So there is this uh, filling with the Spirit, and that's something that's repeatable. But I'm wanting to suggest, and I want to, well, more than suggest, I'm wanting to set forth quite clearly and demonstrate it next, uh, in, in the next two messages, that Christians are baptized with the Spirit once. And today that happens uh, when someone comes to faith in Christ. But there are multiple and repeated fillings by the Spirit. And generally then, in our daily life, what we have to do is we mustn't, certain things we mustn't do. We must not quench the Holy Spirit, do anything that will dampen down his fire in us. We mustn't 
vex the Holy Spirit. Uh, we, we mustn't displease him and we mustn't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. What we must do is seek to bring our lives under the control of the Holy Spirit and what we must do is walk in step with the Holy Spirit. Very well, that's what the Word of God requires us to do. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, forgive us, we pray, for the many times that we've quenched the Holy Spirit, vexed him and grieved him. Forgive us, O oh Lord, we ask, be merciful unto us, and grant that we might day by day look to Jesus Christ and seek day by day to know the refreshing that he gives by the Holy Spirit to live under the control of the Spirit and to walk in the Spirit. Grant it to be so, we ask, for Jesus' sake. Amen. It's been great to have you joining. I do hope you'll come back next Sunday when I'm going to continue this little mini-series. I've broken into a series on the Lord's Prayer. And so two more messages, God willing, on the message of Pentecost uh, before we go back to the Lord's Prayer. But may God bless you. May God bless your loved ones. And may you have a really fruitful week in the service of Jesus Christ. Amen.